Hey everyone, I am back live. If you are tuning in, thank you so much for watching this video. This is Brian Balon, and this is Ask Me Anything Real Estate, uh, sort of open hangout. I don't know how long I'm gonna be up for this, but I just thought, hey, why not? Let's try it, it's Friday night, and love to hang out with you guys. Um, whoever can make it on to this live, probably keep it open for a while though, at least. <laughs> Usually when I go live, I'm at least over 10 minutes. So um, hopefully that is uh, enough time for people to come in and, and check it out. So anyway, the title of this video is Ask Me Anything Real Estate. I know uh, questions are going to be flooding in right away, but if you have a question and you'd like to know something about real estate, uh, just type it in and um, I can field the question as best as I can. Um, but if there aren't any questions, I'm probably just going to talk freely until there is a question, uh, but share with you some things as if, uh, you know, you guys had these questions and I'm just kind of fielding them for you uh, in a presentation that I do with buyers um, and, uh, or, or sellers. And this is also not just for if you're a consumer, but also if you're a realtor. So if you're checking this out and you're a realtor, uh, it'd be great to field some questions for you as well, uh, what it's like in the real estate industry. Um, in fact, I was going to do a video on uh, becoming a realtor if you're interested in doing something like that. Uh, and if you're interested in being a real estate investor, what that's like. Now, <clears throat> I don't have, I'm not, I've, I'm not a real estate investor. I'm a realtor. Uh, I have gotten involved in the real estate investing, but only on the educational side. and. Um, well, actually, that's not true. I've actually done Airbnbs. Uh, I've, I've run an Airbnb whole house listing, uh, became a super host, um, did it for uh, at least a season. When I mean one quarter is what I mean a season. So I could even talk about that, right? So my experiences of Airbnbs um, and how profitable they are, uh, which by the way, uh, Airbnb has in Arizona, fun fact, in Arizona uh, is basically uh, mostly shut down. So the biggest quarter of uh, the of the year for Airbnbs is quarter one, but the best months really are February, uh, February and March, and then there's some lag like the first half, probably the first two weeks of April, and then like the last two weeks of January are like the most ideal times. And the reason why uh, that is is because in Phoenix, Greater Phoenix area, Maricopa County. There is, uh, the weather is just amazing. And that's actually one of the main, top five reasons I learned in real estate school, why people move. Actually, I think it's number, maybe even be number two, uh, maybe even number one, one or two is weather. Uh, we have amazing weather throughout the year. Uh, well, not throughout the year. In the first, like, probably six or seven months. After that, it gets pretty hot. And then, after, and then you know, then uh, it goes back to being cool at the end of the year. And we have a lot of snowbirds that come through. A lot of people have second homes here, investment properties or family that live here that are from the East Coast, Pacific Northwest, from California, from the Southeast or yeah, Southeast. So uh, there's a lot of actually absentee owners where uh, they don't, they're not primary residences of those that own those properties. So they end up becoming Airbnbs and such. So anyway, um, yeah, that's what ends up happening. The Airbnb has basically, people have canceled like crazy uh, because travel bans and the whole COVID-19 stuff, which has actually put Airbnb in a massive strain financially to the point where they got bailed out. They got bailed out a hundred like, or $1 billion, something like that, which is pretty crazy uh, for uh, you know, something like Airbnb to get bailed out like that. But uh, crazy in a sense that, I mean, it really came to prominence probably about three or four years ago in terms of becoming regularly used. And now it's just exploded and is a major competitor to hotels, especially in places that, that allow it, right? So Arizona is very Airbnb friendly. Uh, California and New York are not as friendly. Um, they've really limited short-term leases, which is essentially what Airbnbs are. Uh, they're just short-term leases. They've limited sometimes like two months minimum lease or 30 days minimum lease. 
you know, HOA. So it's like, for instance, if the state or the city doesn't have any stipulation of short-term lease, sometimes HOAs are going to, are starting to crack down on that condos, especially, and uh, making it more difficult for people to operate Airbnbs. But um, if you have one and it's not a COVID-19 year, uh, they generally do well in the first quarter. And depending on location is what will depend on how much you will make in terms of consistent bookings throughout the rest of the year. And, and uh, yeah, so, so yeah, so Airbnb, there's, uh, let's see, if you're a realtor right now, like um, a couple things for the realtor side is uh, one, if you uh, haven't heard already, the iBuyers, which are the, the big companies that basically buy houses cash. Uh, and then they they turn, like fix them up a little bit, which basically means you just paint it, make it move and ready as with as little amount of money as possible, and then turn it around and then sell it back on the market, usually for a profit. Um, those companies have ceased operations. I think all of them except for, I think I've heard of one program that's internal within my brokerage that's still operating, but the rest of them have ceased operations, meaning they're no longer uh, acquiring properties and making offers on them. And on some of the houses that they're actually under contract on, they actually backed out. So it kind of makes it, uh, you know, uh, it's just it's just really interesting because in a good market, those companies tend to thrive really well because, you know, you buy a house, if you have to hold it for two to three months, it's going to appreciate a couple percent, you know, one, maybe 2%, depending on what time of year it is. And, you know, it's pretty low risk and there's a little upside to it. So in a down market, which is, we're not in a down market actually in Phoenix right now, you know, currently fundamentals don't indicate that, but when demand slows down, uh, you know, in this case, it's demand has slowed down, but I, it, when I think about it, it's actually, it, the man you saw in normal markets, 2008, that's what happened. These I buyers, these buy, like we'll buy your house for cash. They disappear because when they acquire a property, you know, if you know, in a month or two, that's going to actually depreciate. So it's not even profitable for that business model. So they typically back out. Um, but if you are in this case, I think the reason why they cease operations is just simply because uh, they they can't. You can, I mean, it's just like everybody else. Um, their the demand has slowed down. Um, it's much riskier to purchase a home and flip it. Um, and they are operating with, you know, hundreds and hundreds, if not a, hundreds and hundreds of employees, at least for most of these eye buyers, these big eye buyers, and they've had to let go of people. Um, so yeah, I mean, they've, they've just sit on the sidelines. I've had an investor company that, that helps with people who purchase, uh, like so the rent to own. So if you're going to buy a house, and well, if you can't, if, like your credit, you know, isn't up to a 620 or whatever the minimum is, they'll take a 550 and uh, just basically rental criteria. And if you pass rental criteria, they'll buy the house for you and you can live in it. So the cool thing about that is in the rental, you can kind of choose what you want, you know, in a sense, but you can actually, this opens up your door where you can not only like rent from the rental inventory, but also rent from the buying inventory as well and then you have the right to purchase it within five years so that that's maintained for you which is pretty neat so um so yeah so i buyers have definitely stepped out and uh, what's unfortunate is a lot of realtors are just stepping out of the business and this is the time where the transition is where in the good market a lot of people foresee that uh, there's a lot of upside to joining or becoming a realtor and you know there's it's easier to sell a house if you get a listing it's easier to sell a house because it's a seller's market all that kind of stuff and the appeal is is great to join and most people know at least a few people that are going to buy or sell a home so what is happening is these new realtors pop up and in the good market and with these new realtors they start taking more of the business because there's a finite amount of business uh, or the finite amount of transactions that happen per year. I think in 2019, it was 100,000 transactions um, in Arizona, both investor and uh, retail, which is through realtors. 
and they uh you know basically they had um I'm trying to say they yeah so there's there's more realtors and the same amount of transactions in a down market there's less transactions but too many realtors what ends up happening is they um there's not enough business to go around too many realtors less business so that's when people start to exit because it becomes harder to acquire uh, a transaction and so it really thins out and the longer that this goes uh, the, more, the less realtors there'll be because the, the less demand there'll be because people are losing their jobs and having to go to unemployment. So many Americans battle becomes instead of I'm ready to buy a house comes to how do I just not get evicted from my place? <laughs> so it definitely is, it, it shifted very radically. I mean, it's, this is a very, very, very fast. You know, when the economy shuts down, it really changes things day by day and, and even especially week to week as we're seeing. So what is the recommendation? If you're a realtor, it's a couple of things. What's really is the message out, the consistent message out there is one is double down. So you have to double down and get really consistent with staying in touch with people that you know um, and also continue to talk to people you don't know and um, just provide being an expert uh, and the resource during this time. Also, um, if uh, you can, um, usually... And the strategy, looking in hindsight, um, the strategy really is to prepare financially. In the good markets, when you're making the money, save the money, um, have an emergency fund for your business. Six months expenses, emergency fund for personal, six months expenses, emergency for your business. And the only way you can know that is that you have a P&L, a running P&L for your business and a personal budget. Um, and uh, and keep it updated consistently and hold every single dollar accountable to making you money if it's in your business or that it has to be uh, for your personal. And, um, and yeah, you know, that's everybody's going to have a different budget and what they want to spend money on, of course. But uh, now, especially as a realtor, is the time to really thin out your expenses. So go back through in your business expenses, whether you have subscriptions to CRMs, uh, to uh, you know dialers, to technology, a website, or if you're hiring people to do marketing. You know, this is a time where you just have to really, really get hypercritical and decide what exactly are you going to spend money on and what exactly are you going to thin out, um, and just be very, very intentional about that. And it was tough for me. Like I was doing it, and I remember how I was reading through a lot of my, my, you know, what I was spending money on. And in January, it was insane. Like I was spending like where I'm at today versus where I was at in January. I'm spending like less than half. Like I cut almost fifty five to sixty percent expenses from in my business from January through March. Uh, and April is looking pretty good as well, even better uh, because of the lag. I started this process in like early March of cutting when all the COVID stuff started to, to become more serious. So cut, you know, cut the expenses and get really critical and, you know, cut, cut, cut. And every month make it a challenge to do even better than the next month. And in the personal, of course, as we're not traveling as much, we're not eating out as much. And, you know, gas right now is a very, you know, all time not all time low, but it's it's pretty low. I mean, I was able to find, I mean, the last time I filled up, I drive a lot. I drive sometimes 1,500 to 2,000 miles because of my job a month. Uh, and I filled up on March 31st and it's April, I think it's April 7th. Yeah, April 17th. So uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, and I think I have like half a tank. So like, I'm not even worried and I could go out like, you know, go, I guess I could go out and, you know, drive around and get out of the house and not really worry because I'm paying $2 and 20 cents for premium is what I pay for. So, so yeah, I mean, the expenses are forced in a sense because of stay at home orders, at least in Arizona. Uh, but yeah, there's probably some things like subscriptions or, uh, you know, just maybe loose uh, or a big one is uh, any loose like late fees or maintenance fees on your, uh, on your accounts to get really critical about that. And, you know, I was spending, I spent like almost a full day spread out over like a week, just getting my, my, uh, we call it those uh, fees taken care of. And actually most of them were, you know, they went back as far as they could and I neglected it. Right. Cause in the good times, it's easier to neglect. 
excuse me, ne- neglect your uh, finances and just let the small stuff go. But, but yeah, so I, I got through and something, I think it was like $500 or something like that in, in fees that I recouped. Yeah, it was, it was close to that. So, which, you know, goes to show, I mean, in credit card, you laid on a credit card, like two days, they charge you a late fee, which is 40 bucks. And then the interest fee, which is like on a daily rate of like 17%. So it's like 26 to $30 for interest and then $40 for a late fee. So like, it's crazy, like how much, you know, I owe for um, late fees if you're late for like even a day. <clears throat> so yeah, um, it was neat, nice of them to do that for sure. But you won't be able to do that unless you can test it. So definitely um, do, you know, tighten up because uh, if you ride this out and you stay consistent with your doubling down and really staying connected to people, by the time things start to normalize, you're going to be in a position that's ready to expand. And uh, interestingly, a lot of realtors think, oh, this is a down market. This is the time where where I will lose business or this is the time where my business at, uh, retracts. That's actually one perspective to see it. Uh, one other way to think about it is this is actually the time where it expands because as you're going through uh, your, you know, the, this time, as people are exiting the business, but you're staying in touch, you may not close as many transactions as you would in a normal market, but the connections you're making and the people that probably had that the realtors that were probably were going to work with those people that you're talking to now are exiting the business. That means that's more business for you. So uh, what's interesting in the past, you know, this past like seller's market, which has been, you know, the past, like basically four years, four or five years, the, that time frame. Uh, I was thinking, I was like, how come it's so hard to really, you know, get in with people and, you know, get a listing and that kind of thing. And, um, and I realized it's the people that stuck it out for a while, you know, that are, whether they're, cause maybe they're still new and they're, but they're, they're very much in, you know, they're keeping in contact with people and providing that value or they were on the other side where they were in a, you know, been a, you know in the real estate for like 15 years and they just stayed super consistent. And when in the good market, they're really just getting a bunch of referrals because they're already known. So this is the time for you to, uh, get those connections so that when they are ready later down the road, as things normalize or they're ready to buy a house, uh, that's ready to go. So in my case, I have so many, so many, uh, contacts that are wanting to buy, but the prices are too high. And all of a sudden when this thing turned a little bit, they caught wind of some news and they heard something on you know, from friends or coworkers and they called me and they said, Hey, you know, is, what's it like now? Can we buy a house now? And, um, and it's, you know, it's kind of neat because I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, okay, we have a, quite a bit of people that are going to want to buy a house now that the market is turning and possibly some people that want to sell. So, um, so yeah, so it's definitely, definitely stay in touch. And, and that's what I've done, you know, throughout the, even the good market is stay in touch with these, these people that I have and know. Um, and yeah, hopefully it'll pay off soon. So, yeah, uh, let's see. Any other questions? So if you're just checking in, if you are watching right now, uh, please, uh, this is a op- Ask Me Anything Real Estate. So I'm just kind of talking now until a question comes up. So feel free to write something if you want, and I will try and head that up. So let's see what else can I talk about. Okay, the mar- okay I'll talk about the market a little bit. So basically in the market, it's – interesting because the you know the what is it the news is telling us the sky's falling um you know we're in a recession now and it's like 2008 it's really not like 2008 this is completely different than 2008 the, the, maybe the only similarity is that it's heading towards the buyer's market so right now we're still actually in a seller's market especially in the 400,000 and under And we've only seen a slight decrease in pendings, which is one way we track. Pendings are anything that gets under contract. We've seen a slight decrease in pendings, which is an indicator of demand. And we've seen an increase in supply. Well, well, right now, right before all COVID-19 stuff happened, we've been in pretty record low inventory. So 
that's what's driving the prices up uh, because it's just a lot of demand, a lot of people that want to buy houses, not enough houses for sale. And uh, the houses that are for sale get snatched up so quickly. Um, there are houses that I've sold that have been on market two days, three days. I mean, it's it's pretty hot. It's a pretty hot market. And and uh, that's all it takes. That's all it takes is to uh, to sell a house. Now, uh, as things have turned, now we're seeing higher days on market, more supply. We've seen people back out. Uh, they were under contract, so fall through. Uh, contracts have increased. And of course, the iBuyers have, have uh, backed out of their deals and are no longer in operations. So there's definitely a, a retraction. Uh, but not enough for it to affect the overall demand. Now, there are houses that are still selling for two days, three days on market, uh, as long as it's priced correctly. So, um, so yeah, so that's uh, basically what's happening. Now, if you go over a million, um, that's a different market again. Uh, and also a 400 to like 600, 600 to 8, 800 to a million. It, the higher, the closer to a million you get, actually, uh, last I checked, it was, it's more of a balanced market. Uh, and then 3 million is like very, buy, like 3 million and over is a heavy buyer's market uh, because there's just not a lot of, you know, people, out, the, just the demand there, the, the pool of buyers and that price range is just low. So, um, so yeah, so overall, um, the market's doing okay. Think of it as instead of going 180 miles an hour, it's going 85, 90. So still cruising in the fast lane, just not as hot as it once was. People are a little bit more tentative and more fearful about jumping into something. So uh, yeah, yeah. But I mean, the inventory is increasing, which is a good sign for buyers. Uh, and yeah, the demand has cooled a little bit. So this might be an ideal time if you are looking to buy a house to actually jump in. If you need help with that in the Phoenix area, contact me. If you're not in the Phoenix area, I'd still love to help you. can get you connected with someone who can really take care of you as well. Uh, and then also interesting thing with the mortgages, the mortgage industry is actually getting pretty constricted right now as well. In 2008, the reason why the stock or the, the market crashed was because of fraudulent loans, specifically mortgages. This time, that's just not the case. Uh, because of 08, specific laws have been enacted. And now uh, there's, it's very hard to write a fraudulent loan. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. So as loans are not more legit, what actually is the concern now is uh, the fact that people have, uh, you know, they, they've uh, lost their, uh, jobs or the fact that their income has decreased or the general sentiment of fear. Um, it's, it's caused this retraction has caused even mortgage companies to um, consider tightening up, at least at a very minimum, tightening up their criteria. They have uh, like FHA loans. Uh, they can take a 580 credit score for an FHA loan normally. Um, I've heard now they're doing 620. Uh, 660. I've heard some lenders like, we're not taking anyone under 700. Uh, and the reason why that is, is a couple of reasons. One is that the rates right now are so low. And also um, the the fact that the market has like crap, like it crap, like just thousands and thousands of points over the span of like a week and a half. Um, these loans are investments. And they some of those funds are actually tied into Wall Street. Um, and some of these investors are also in Wall Street. Uh, and that money that they're investing uh, is not as secure as it once was and is uh, becoming riskier to loan uh, because of people losing their jobs and because of the econ economic situation. And, um, and so because the interest rates are super low, they're not making a lot of money anyway. And then with, mixed in with a general sentiment of fear going on with if I lend someone money, will they be able to pay later on? And then the stock market money and, you know, a lot of these investors, cash is also tied in uh, into the stock market. Um, they're, they've been hit. Uh, I did see an article about the mortgage industry claiming that they may even need a bailout as well. Again, if they don't, if things don't ease up because of all this deferment, CARES Act had 
gave a provision for mortgages and renters to not have to pay to defer their payments for up to 120 days, right? It was, and and if the lenders aren't getting paid uh, by the homeowners, then I mean, so the, so let's backtrack. So there's so basically with lenders, you have your investor, like who actually has the money, and you have a servicer, and they're like two different things. The servicer will actually service your loan. Uh, and be the one that you make payments to. Um, but ultimately, the servicer will take a portion of that and give it to the actual investor. So the investor is like, I don't want anything to do. You know, you guys serve. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes I believe there are some cases where, I mean, clearest example, hard money loans, you know, they'll service it and also give you them also the investor. Um, so, but yeah, these servicers will, will take the, the payments and ensure that, uh, that you, you know the homeowner is on time, et cetera, and making sure that they're paying the insurance and the taxes and all that stuff, so that there's no problem uh, and no no one can contest the the home ownership interest that the homeowner has, <clears throat> which protects the investor, right? So here's what happens in the event that you they defer payments. So let's say 120 days worth of deferred payments means uh, that the servicer is not getting paid, but the investor is still expecting the money. So what's happening is the servicers are not having to fork out the money to the investors, but they don't, ha- I mean, the servicers don't have a lot of money to, they, I mean, that's not what their, their business model wasn't designed to pay people's mortgages. Um, so uh, think about the strain and demand that is on servicers and then the impact that's having on investors. So with all of these things happening, it's causing a real serious issue uh, or issues in the mortgage industry. So if you do, if you're looking to buy a house right now and you're seeing a lot of issues, uh, there it is. Uh, you're, you're, uh, it's definitely harder to get them right now than it was even a month and a half ago. Uh, so if that's the case, um, you know, stick it out, you know, definitely stay consistent. Even what I talked to realtors about earlier, do for yourself, try and save as much money as you possibly can. So, yep. I, yeah, I'm almost half hour into this. It is getting late, it's 10, 10 p.m. my time, and um, appreciate you if you have been watching. And I just kind of spitball. I might you might hear this stuff again. You know, I'm trying to keep in touch with, with what's going on in the real estate market all the time. So uh, you might hear some repeat stuff later on in future videos. But I thought I'd try this open forum. If anyone has any questions, again, uh, just feel free to comment. Also, if you're watching this after, I mean, after it's live, after it's recorded and posted, then uh, yeah, feel free to type a comment and I'll check it out and answer it. Might even make a video for you on it as well to address your questions. So anyway, guys, hope you are having a great Friday night. And uh, again, please like, comment, subscribe. If you haven't already, your support is greatly appreciated. And lots more content coming to you soon. I want to get out there more and maybe do some tours of the city. Uh, tours of just what it's like, maybe give you a reflection of what it's like to live in Phoenix if you're from out of state. Uh, I've been, I'm a native here in Arizona and I've lived here all my life, minus like two or six months that I traveled to the US, which is another story for another time. But, uh, but yeah, and uh, so stay tuned for that stuff. And uh, all right, guys, we will catch you later.